New Silver Discoveries. You are not going to want to miss this exciting interview with Max Porterfield of Kalanex Mines. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching Yankee Stacking. As I sit here recording this video, we have just witnessed a massive shift in power for the United States. You know what I'm talking about, right? Regardless of where you stand politically, this is a sea change, folks. I think it will likely spell a whole new era for our country. I think it has some big implications on the U.S. economy and silver and gold. In this video, I'm going to be talking with Max Porterfield, the CEO of Kalanex Mines. I'm going to ask Max his opinions on what a new administration means for silver and and gold and where he thinks the overall markets are headed in 2021. And we're going to talk about his company and specifically some news that broke just over a week ago. Elevated Silver Discoveries at one of their incredible projects. Welcome Max. Thanks so much for joining Yankee Stacking. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. By the way, before we get into things, uh, mm -hmm. I've got a big affinity for dragons, and so I like a lot of those coins I'm seeing there. Oh, you do, huh? You like this one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big one? <laughs> what do you think? That's incredible. Yeah, no, Isn't that incredible. amazing? There's a lot of artwork that goes into that, you know? There really is, yeah. This is what I call a lot of my silver ice cream cones, okay? This is not the base of my stacking, if you will. I focus on other things, but I, I, mean, I love this stuff. Speaking of dragons, check this one out. It's an oldie but goodie. The uh, Queen's cool. Beast, yeah. Before we discuss your uh, company, the Kalanex Mines, and uh, the great news you recently announced, what happened today as of the recording of this video on Wednesday, January 20th, Joe Biden is our U.S. president. To probably, Very sure is. I know, right? But um, we had a blue sweep in our Congress, too. So I yeah. started off the video by saying, I think this represents a sea change in the future of our country and our economy. Do, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I do agree with that. I think that uh, if anyone was wondering if there's going to be more stimulus, um, <laughs> I think they can bet their house on it. Yeah. Uh, because uh, there's really not going to be no checks and balances to that end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the continuous indebting of the nation. Uh, it really... It, I think the future of our children and our children's children uh, is something of great concern. Uh, and with that, um, you know, the U.S. dollar is not going to do so well. And I think that is in turn going to be very, very beneficial for the precious metal space, obviously, base metals and real assets as a well. whole. I mean, you know, last March and in, uh, in April, you speak of the dollar. It, it was strengthening a lot. I mean, I think it was because... You know, people were uh, rushing to, you know, safe haven assets. But since then, the dollar has been in free fall for months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, what's going on in uh, March of last year, March 2020, we're yep. talking, uh, yep. is very similar to what you saw during the financial crisis, crisis oh, 2008. Really, yep. 2008 uh, was, I guess you'd call it the first kind of financial crisis I probably lived through as an adult. <laughs> uh, but... That, uh, that financial crisis, really all assets correlated. Um, you had gold come off, silver come off. Mm -hmm. uh, really all the, the equities were uh, on a lot of duress given everything that was going on at the time. There was a lot of fear out there. Uh, yeah. And so that was no different in, in uh, this most recent uh, situation with the pandemic. Uh, the amount of fear, if you could go back in time and look at fear, peaked probably right around mid-March. Uh, uh, and that's always a really big buying signal is when everybody's really, really scared. It's probably when things aren't as bad as everyone thinks it is. Uh, so, you know, if you were a buyer then, mm -hmm. that was a tremendous long-term buying opportunity uh, because, again, all assets correlated momentarily. Uh, but you've seen the precious metals, uh, as you follow very closely, mm -hmm. I imagine, uh, perform very, very well coming out of that. And, and, you know, the U.S. dollar is continuing to weaken, and I don't see why that anytime soon, given, you know, they're already talking another $1.9 trillion, where I think they spent, you know, another trillion just about a month and a half ago or so. Know, so, right? and... Um, I don't like to be a negative person. I'm a very general in the exploration business, but I, I do mm. find it very concerning overall. I do too. I mean, we reached um, 10 year, 15 year, 25 year lows uh, in the dollar compared to other fiat currencies. We hit all time lows 
with the U.S. dollar against gold. I mean, it's it's crazy, Max. It's like the Roaring Twenties all over again. Well, I think it's, a lot of that's probably pricing in inflation. So if the dollar is really not going to be worth a whole lot. Then what are the underlying assets you know that you're pricing U.S. dollars worth? And you know, and you're having the best of both worlds in the in the mining space, in my opinion, for a secular bull market in commodities overall. Given that you've had a lack of investment in exploration, mm-hmm. uh, development of of uh, assets, mm-hmm. I mean, we're based precious metals explore ourselves. It's been a tough grind over the you know the past ten years since the financial crisis, uh, where really the the industry overall has been void of a lot of exploration dollars that would normally be going into it. Mm. And with that, you have, you know, these discoveries are getting much, much uh, more difficult to make. Oftentimes coming in very remote areas, which right. is uh, another challenge yep. in, in many ways. Where do you see precious metals going in the next four years? This, this next four years of the Biden administration? Much higher. Uh, I mean, I think that, um, you know, gold's basing on in, is stabilizing uh, for a very, very strong move over the past year uh and the same thing with silver silver had a very very strong year coming out of the march lows Mm -hmm. uh and you know i think it is you know these long-term prices are here to stay and you know you need to kind of uh things to base out a bit before you move higher and they're they're definitely giving every catalyst in the world for this to move higher Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, quite quite honestly i'm surprised it hadn't moved higher faster given the speed at which they're printing money but um i don't know that's a a matter of time yeah. Matter of time, you know. One other thing too. 2020 was uh, an amazing year for electric vehicles or EV stocks too. And again, sure. right? And and yeah. silver and gold stackers sometimes talk about how you know metals uh, are needed to produce the batteries in these cars. But it we seem to be in the minority, Max. It feels like you know people don't realize, don't understand the the stuff that you mine and how important it is to produce electric vehicles. Am I right about yeah. this? No, the reality is if you touch it, it's either been pumped out of the ground as a hydrocarbon, it's been grown, uh, or it's been mined. Uh, and that's just how <laughs> the reality of the situation. I like you know, that. That's just how it works. So a lot of people don't appreciate the links that people in, you know, like Calinex and other companies mm-hmm. go to uh, make discoveries. Um, literally, a lot of people put their lives on the line for this. Uh, and, and then the miners also in these different communities out there, you know, it's a very tough job in industry overall. But it's absolutely critical. I, you know, the base metal space, I like to call it as the building blocks of the global economy. They call it copper, Dr. Copper, for a reason. Mm. Uh, obviously, it's a good be- bellwether for the global economy. Um, but it's because it's that critical to our everyday life. Uh, so, absolutely. Yeah. Why do you think the mining sector as a whole has uh, such incredible upside this year? Well, I, again, it's the best of both worlds. You're going to be in a weak dollar environment. All these commodities are going to be based in U.S. dollars, so you're naturally going to have a lift uh, in the underlying commodity prices in a weak U.S. dollar environment. You're going to have strong growth coming out of China. I mean, mm. Q4 last year, they were at 6.5% growth, so they um, have been able to avert the whole COVID situation. Uh, and then I think, you know, a lot of this spending uh, overall yeah. is going to drive, you know, consumption, uh, and that's going to be healthy. And, and again, as I mentioned before, it's a supply side problem as well. When you have a demand and a big demand shift like you're seeing with EV and, you know, really the move away from hydrocarbons or, you know, oil mm-hmm. uh, in terms of you know, kind of powering things, uh, you know, that's going to have to be replaced one way or another by something else. And that something else happens mm-hmm. to be copper uh, is going to be a big, obviously, a benefactor of that. Zinc, uh, silver on the industrial side, definitely technology use. Uh, you know, is all going to benefit from that. So mm-hmm. again, you've got a tight supply side situation in these metals, uh, but at the same time, you've got big demand drivers. And another thing, another thing that hasn't been done yet, and again, I'm quite shocked with how much money they're spending uh, and printing here, mm-hmm. uh, that they're taking on to get us out of the situation is, is lack of infrastructure spending. Infrastructure spending is, is a big driver for long-term job creation. And mm-hmm. that's something that hasn't been done in the United States really since the 1950s. That coupled with the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative out of China, which is yep. an infrastructure plan that's never been seen to the scale that they're looking to accomplish, is going to be a big, big driver for these metals. Uh, and quite frankly, I think, you know, everybody, if they're going to agree on one thing, they'd like to actually see where the dollars are going. And there's no better place than, you know, when you're actually driving on that road or when you go to the airport that's not dilapidated. Um, and you get to appreciate, you know, some of where your tax dollars are, or which is, you say, your, your children's future debt. <laughs> um, it's, it's going to fund. Yep. Um, so, you know, and, and, and that's just, you know, I think a big, big driver for the metal space moving forward. All right. So we're going to talk 
in more detail about Kalinex mining. And before I do, I just want to tell everybody that's watching this video that we're going to talk about a highly speculative investment. This is a microcap stock. It's a lot of volatility. So I always say, do your homework on this. All right. And for me, uh, a big part of my homework um, when I'm looking to invest in a mining company is what I call the Yankee Quadrant. All right. So that's four factors uh, that I consider when I'm looking to invest. It's management, projects, ownership, and company financials. So let's go over this together, shall we, Max? Let's, uh, let's... Absolutely, we'll, we'll go through it one by one. All right, cool. Let's start with you though. I, you have over 10 years of experience in uh, natural resources and financial markets. Uh, you were previously with Brazil Resources, Inc. and Uranium Energy Corp. and U.S. Global Investors too. What drew you to Kalinex? Really, you know, I came on to Kalinex in, uh, in mid-2014. Mm -hmm. uh, I was much, much younger then and had an opportunity and really what drew me to, to it was uh, an ability to work with a, a man named Mike Maslowski. He's mm -hmm. our former chairman. He's the founder of Kalinex. Uh, he's a 2011 inductee into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame for the discovery of 15 mines, 13 of them in Manitoba, where we're actually mm -hmm. you know, have a rapidly, rapidly expanding discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm a big believer that you align yourself with successful people. Uh, and successful people tend to gravitate towards other successful people. Yeah. And to have a mentor like Mike Maslowski was a, a big opportunity. He's, he's been there and he's got a tremendous amount of experience in, in terms of the, you know, over 50 years in the camp. Yep. Um, exploring. He saved the, you know, the town in 1982. He was credited with the discovery of the Trout Lake Mine. Jim Pakel, uh, another member of our team, is a former head of England's VMS arm. He won mm. the Bill Dennis Award, which is why, you know, kind of wearing, winning the Grammy for... Uh, the best album of the year, uh, but for discoveries for the Triple Seven Mine, which is a, an anchor mine for Hut Bay in the Flint Flon area, and numerous other mines, mm -hmm. and then uh, Alan Vals, our geophysicist on our team, he won the same award for the Lawler Mine, which is another very large uh, mine in the, in the Flint Flon Green, Snow Lake Greenstone Belts, mm -hmm. uh, and num as well as a number of others in his career working with Hut Bay, and then JJ O'Donnell is uh, our exploration manager on our team. He's actually former triple seven mine manager in Manitoba there. He was actually VP exploration for one of the largest undeveloped zinc deposits in the world in, in the Yukon, Canada. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a, a strong team that's been a part of yeah. numerous world-class discoveries. Right. And we're looking to do it again with a focus of job creation in these communities. As you were rattling those years off, if I'm not mistaken, I think it, you have like over a hundred years worth of geology experience there. I don't think they like talking about their age. They, they have been collectively <laughs> credited with the discovery of three of the four largest mines in the Flint Flon camp's history. Wow. And that should be noted as a camp that's almost a hundred years of continuous production across 32 mines and counting. Let's talk about the locations. You're, you're, you're throwing the names out. I want people to understand, uh, and I'll put up you know, uh, a nice map so you can see where we're talking about. But first, let's take a quick break. Okay, we're back with Max Porterfield. And Max, you have three main districts in uh, Kalinex, I think, all in Canada, with several projects in each of those. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So in terms of the portfolio, you're right. We're, we're established in, uh, and focused on exploring in close proximity to these known Canadian mining jurisdictions. In these areas, you have the geologic endowment, you have the infrastructure, you've got the, the history, so there's a permitting regime, and then you've got the people there. And these are all really the key things that you need to, uh, you know, take a deposit once discovered to the next level. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're looking for something really remote uh, and far away, your, your discovery needs to be that much bigger because of the very large upfront capital the costs. Distance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that all that together and being in Canada in terms of a tier one jurisdiction, you know, I obviously liked it so much when I moved up here. I actually became a Canadian as I'm a dual citizen now. Um, and when I started looking around exploration in this country, I, I didn't see a lot going on. As I mentioned, it's been a tough go in, in exploration in general over the past a number of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I saw it as a big opportunity. The team did as well. And that's when we acquired and diversified the portfolio into the Bathurst District mm -hmm. with our Nash Creek deposit. And Nash Creek is actually... Historically, um, when we acquired it, it was a zinc-lead deposit hmm. uh, at Nash Creek. Very quickly, the team went away. We were able to double the resource, uh, and then we published a maiden preliminary economic assessment, see what the potential economics around that deposit would be. Is that the, what the PEA -P means, preliminary economic assessment? Yes. That, that's what that is. Okay. That's what that means. We did that really because Nash Creek's unique in a lot of ways, the, the, the zinc deposit 
itself and it's flat lying near surface it sits roughly just over a kilometer off a provincial highway that's 25 kilometers away from a deep water port a rail line that takes you to smelting operations power station right there and, yep. and again the community is there so it's ideally located to that end and um, when you're exploring for mines you look for different chargeable or resistive rock properties okay and so we did that over a district scale and then and when we drill tested uh, some targets that were derived by our team uh, that led to the discovery of near-surface silver, uh, which is very, very exciting for us. Were those uh, the two discoveries last year? That's that correct. You... Yeah. Okay. So we discovered near-surface yep. silver mm -hmm. um, that, again, uh, is controlled by this main controlling fault, 6.8 kilometers apart. So it's very, very long distance apart. Mm. And uh, we've just announced results from a soil sampling campaign where essentially we take samples at regular intervals along over a 10 kilometer distance yep. that encompass both those silver discoveries from last year. And what we're looking for that is anomalous uh, amounts of uh, different elements, silver mm -hmm. obviously being a key one of those, <laughs> uh, so that when we follow up, we've got a good idea in terms of how we vector to find additional higher grade and more mineralization as we build out the discoveries there. And that's, I think, is that what you announced? What was it January 11th? That's this correct. We were looking for elevated uh, silver in the soil samples that we we've taken oh, okay. and they coincide very very nicely with the other data sets that we have uh, and that's one of the key things that our team focuses on is, mm -hmm. is a multi-data sets uh in terms of our the tools we use to vector mm -hmm. uh, when we do drilling it, and this was um potentially higher grade silver right i think you mentioned that yeah that's the focus you know we're happy with the grades we initially hit mm -hmm. uh, but we're looking to improve the grades and, and uh, start building a significant resource in nash creek but the mineralization that we hit in both those discovery holes mm -hmm. uh, again is a silver dominant near surface uh, which is very quite unique and a very very exciting discovery that's just the one district why don't we touch on uh the flint Flon district in manitoba that's right yeah flint Flon, manitoba and I, again uh, both the Bathurst district and the Flint Flon districts are world renowned. Mm. There's been additional 31 mines that have been found in the camp. Wow. Now the unique situation there, and, and again, I mentioned and kind of alluded to is, is job creation through discovery. And you know, if you look at Bathurst pre pandemic, you're looking at over 20 plus percent unemployment rate in those areas. So that is also wow. going to assist because you're going to get a lot of community support uh, for the discoveries because it's, yep. you know, again, the focus is on long-term job creation and, um, mm. You know, that's that's the end result that we're looking to achieve here. And we look to plan point. to make a lot of money for ourselves and our shareholders in the meantime through that process. Obviously, we we're in the midst of making a discovery with the rainbow discovery. That's a high grade copper, gold, silver and zinc discovery uh, in Manitoba in Flint Flon. We're 16 kilometers away. So is that the Pine Bay project? That's correct. At the okay. Pine Bay project. It's wow. The name of the deposit is the rainbow deposit. Okay. And we're really at the early innings of that. Mm -hmm. Exceptionally high grade copper uh, there. You're, you're looking at you know six, seven, eight percent copper grades, and a lot of these drill intersections. And in it's you know very early into the discovery, and it's ideally located. You know the discovery is actually again as I mentioned, you have road access there. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a high voltage hydroelectric source power line, and again that's a big thing. Is obviously getting sourced for um, the the. The, your production is you know, power yep. and so yep. having a hydroelectric power line it's, it's clean power uh, and it's also ideally located within a mineral lease the discovery is actually within a mineral lease so it's advanced permitting uh, so again that can be fast paced which is what we're you know planning on you know looking to achieve there mm -hmm. uh, and so we you know again we're looking to announce the final results from um, the, the step out drilling that we completed in December of last year, going in December of last year, mm -hmm. uh, as well as some targeting and, uh, and really, really excited about that discovery. I think, again, it's very early stages on something that's going to be very, very important uh, for the company uh, and more importantly, in many ways, for the community of Flint Flon, Manitoba and the people that live out there. Excellent. Last district we'll touch on real quick is the uh, Buckins in uh, Newfoundland. Yeah, so Point Leamington's a historic resource right now, and it's a, a sizable uh, gold, copper, zinc deposit. We're looking to do an updated resource and bring that up to 43101 standards. That's you know kind of the uh, approved by the regulatory body here in, in Canada, mm -hmm. which is very very important. Uh, and you know again, I think there's some opportunities looking into how the historic resource is modeled. Uh, there's potential to improve upon that, and, and also with the backdrop of much higher metal prices, it's a real opportunity and a real asset for the company. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, our team staked 
uh, targets, uh, just like we've done in Nash Creek. We, were, you know, Nash Creek, we acquired that asset and then we grew it by staking uh, based upon the team. And we've done the same thing at Point Leamington. Uh, so that's something that's kind of earlier stages in, in terms of where we are in terms of activity. Uh, but it's certainly a very, very valuable asset for the company and something that we're going to be advancing uh, in tandem with everything else we're doing. But again, the focus for this company is going to be uh, the Rainbow Discovery in Manitoba, mm. yep. uh, followed by uh, the silver near surface uh, that we're intersecting in, in New Brunswick. Right. So let's talk really quick ownership. I, I care very much about insider ownership. It's very important to me. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for one, I'm a, I'm a big believer that you've got to own your own deal. And uh, I'm a very large shareholder of Kalinex. I own myself just under 5%. Uh, my family is a big supporter as well, mm. uh, as well as Mike Moslowski, for example. He's a very large shareholder, I think just under 5% himself. Uh, resource Capital Funds on the institutional side has been a long-term supporter uh, of the company. They were the, the, one of the first institutional investors that we brought in uh, once I joined the company. They're a long-term private equity-centric fund, uh, and we're one of the earliest exploration companies they've ever invested in, so we're really quite pleased with them as being on the registry and continue to be supportive, uh, as well as the Savelli family out of uh, Europe. It's a, a very high net worth family office. They've got a long history of um, investing in discoveries and exploration companies. From what I can tell, it's almost 50% ownership outside of uh, re, you know your retail investors. What's well, a tight share structure, just 11 million shares outstanding. Yeah, so we've, we've got a, a limit of operating capital right now in the treasury. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll look to do a capital raise at, at the right time. Uh, to fund the uh, the drilling results and the ongoing drilling that we need to as we expand these discoveries. And in terms of debt, the, the company has no debt. I'm not a big proponent on taking debt out on companies that don't generate revenue, like That's exploration phenomenal. companies. So no, there, yeah. there's absolutely no debt. Um, and, and again, uh, that tight structure, you know, really poised to perform in this type of market environment. Yeah, you get any exciting news coming? I mean, the news keeps listen, dropping. We got exciting. Yeah, I mean, listen, we try to stay active and, and uh, we have results from Flint Flon and okay. the path forward in Flint Flon is the biggest thing coming in the very, very near term. Okay. Uh, I think that's, you know, we have to announce the step out results as well as targeting uh, in the new year. Yep. And I think that, again, you know, everything that we're working on is going to be very compelling, just like it, it has been up until now. What has been the greatest challenge that you face as CEO of Cali Next Minds? The greatest challenge I'd say would be um, just managing the, the macroeconomic factors that really are out of your control in many ways. You're running a public company and it's managing risk. You have to keep in mind that the statistical odds uh, that an exploration uh, target goes on to be a producing mine are around one in 4,000. And so we look to mitigate those odds in a number of ways, obviously proximity mm -hmm. uh, to infrastructure, mm -hmm. which being in the, the known camps, uh, and going after these areas with a, a model uh, and a team that's done it before, and I have no doubt we'll do it again, uh, and, and doing it systematically and doing it very, I think, wisely in terms of you know picking those targets one by one. I'm very methodical, I'd say, is, is the best word to describe things. Well, this has been really awesome. A lot of fun, Max. I appreciate it. Oh, actually, can I show you one more dragon? Yeah, for sure. There I you go. The double dragon, dragon this time. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Ying to the yang of the dragon. You got it. Yep. Uh, how can people get in touch with you if they have more questions about Kalinex? Yeah, our contact details are on our website at kalinex.ca. Uh, you can you go there and, and sign up to receive our news or reach out to us by email or phone. Mm -hmm. And additionally, obviously, if you uh, like what you see there or have any questions and, and uh, you want to become a shareholder of the company, we trade on the Toronto Venture Exchange mm -hmm. under the ticker CNX as well as the OTC under the ticker CLLXF. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining me today, Max. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate, most importantly, the uh, the dragon coins. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, you point me in the right direction on that. I will definitely help you out. I've included all the information on Kalinex Mines right down there in the description of my video. Check them out. There's some really good links in there. And well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and comment below. And as always, I hope your day is A-OK. -okay.